And all right, so uh, today we are lucky to have Andre Lupu and Brandon Tui uh, presenting adversarial diversity and multi agent coordination. Uh, Andre is a first year PhD student at the University of Oxford in Meta AI London, su supervised by Jacob Forster and Roberta Reiliano. Uh, prior to that, he completed his uh, Master's of Science at Mila with uh, Professor Forster and Professor Doina Kwikup, where he studied the importance of policy diversity in zero shock coordination. Following tragedy and adversity, his current focus is on explainable reinforcement learning and few shot partner adaptation. He also firmly believes that research on cooperative AI should not shy away from the wonderful challenges posed by stochasticity and partial observability. Whereas Brandon is a research engineer at Mosaic ML. Prior to that, he spent three years at Meta AI, formerly FAIR, working in deep reinforcement learning with a particular focus on cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning. Currently, is focused on efficient ML and incorporating feedback in large-scale generative AI. Uh, we're really excited to have you, and if you guys want to take it away from here, um, I will mute myself. Sweet. Thanks for having us. Uh, so this is a work, Restoral Diversity in Hanabi. It was an outstanding paper, I believe, like top 25% at iClear this year. Uh, so this is joint work with Brandon. Uh, and also Samuel Sokota, Hengen, who David Wu and Jacob Forrester, all of which were at some point at uh, Meta. Uh, so our goal for this work is to generate diverse, skilled, and reasonable policies for ad hoc team play. And we are going to uh, clarify what each of those terms mean throughout the talk, uh, but remind yourselves that we are in a fully cooperative setting. So whatever I'm going to say is going to be in a fully cooperative setting uh, for the entire work. So first, uh, what is ad hoc team play? Well, in 2000, uh, 2010, Peter Stone defined it as efficiently and robustly collaborating with previously unknown teammates on tasks to which they are all individually capable of contributing as team members. So what that means is that we are going to train some agent uh, using some algorithm uh, in simulation, and then we're going to test that agent with new test time agents and see how well it's able of collaborating with those unknown teammates at test time. Uh, so those teammates could be humans, those teammates could be other agents. And in the, con in the context where we don't have uh, unlimited humans to try to test how well gener uh, generalize is there, we want to be able to test at least with a number of different uh, artificial agents. Then the question is, where do these agents come from? And this is something that Peter Stone's paper doesn't answer. It's also something that multiple papers uh, have struggled with. And if you, if you look at the ad hoc uh, literature, many of them will either use some like variation on the reward or different architecture or different algorithms like say DQ1 and PPO to try and induce some form of diversity to be able to test. Um, but there is a broader question of like, how well do those methods work? Well not very well, and also how do we actually generate diversity? So we are especially uh, looking at Hanabi, which is a stochastic, partial observable, cooperative card game. And the question is, how do we generate uh, diversity in such a complex game? And if you're not familiar with Hanabi, don't worry, we're actually going to go over the basic of the rules later on. Um, so we can have a quick look at past approaches, uh, especially the more, the more recent ones. One of the first papers I was looking at diversity in Hanabi uh, is this paper that used map elites. Uh, if you're not familiar with map elites, the way it works is that you define some features in which you care about being diverse. So in their case, they have risk aversion and communicativeness. Uh, and you have to, de you have to like, define them using some uh, domain knowledge specific to your environment. And then they used evolution on a set of rules that the agents follow kind of as a program. Like, does rule one apply, does rule two apply, and so on, to try and come up with agents to fill out that table. Uh, this method is a diverse somewhat because you do get some range of diversity, but you have to specify the features you care about in advance, which is an issue. Are the models killed? Well, the best models they have achieve just shy of. Uh, 21 score, the maximum in Hanabi is 25, and we know that it gets exponentially harder. So like going from say 19 to 20 uh, for a trained agent is way easier than going from 23 to 24. And are they reasonable? I would say yes, uh, because those 
are able to generalize with uh, similar policies, but it's also not surprising because they're rule-based, so there's nothing really that can break. Um, another more recent paper is collaborating with humans without human data. Uh, and so in this pa paper, what they do is they train a population of uh, software agents. So they get a bit of diversity there, but just in terms of symmetries in the environment. And then they train a best response to that and to pass checkpoints. So they also get diversity in terms of different skills, uh, skill levels, uh, by training with past checkpoints that are not fully converged. Uh, the issue is that this will not necessarily cover the range of possible strategies if your algorithm is biased towards some solutions. Uh, with this does this approach produce skilled agents? Sure, it produces agents that perform well in an environment. But are they reasonable? No. Uh, the main issue is that it overly relies on self-play as a method, which has been shown in past works in zero-shot coordination to produce to follow arbitrary conventions in a way that uh, leads to them not being interpretable or very, being very hard to follow. And then there's LiPo, uh, the paper we're talking about just before the recording started. Uh, and this is concurrent work. It was also published at iClear. And they follow a same principle that we base ourselves on, which is two policies that are similar are going to be compatible and play well together. Uh, and vice versa, if two policies don't play well together, it's likely because they're incompatible. Uh, this work, th does it produce diversity? We tried it. They only do it in Overcooked. We tried it in Hanabi because it's our baseline. Uh, does it produce diversity? Yes. Does it produce skilled agents that know how to play Hanabi well? Also, yes. Are those policies reasonable? Absolutely not. Uh, and this might sound like strong wording, but we are going to show why in just a few slides. Um, so, Brandon, I think, oh, uh, yeah, before that, there's the uh, one last slide, which is some of our own work, which is trajectory diversity. Uh, this was the first work in our, that we, the first thing we tried for diversity in Hanabi and was basically trying to have a population with the best response uh, and try to apply a diversity loss to push away those policies as much as possible uh, and so generate a range of different behaviors that the best response could generalize to. Uh, and this, in this particular work, we used an information theoretic loss for diversity, which is the jensen Chan divergence applied to trajectories. The details don't really matter. The issue is this loss is quite complex and it's very hard to tune. You can either get into a scenario where you put too much weight on it and you start damaging the performance of the policies, or vice versa, you don't put enough um, and it has no effect. It also We also run into issues where the policies would maximize uh, this objective in a way that numerically looks that they are different. But in practice, if you actually are to look at the behavior, we don't see that much uh, diversity. So this worked to regularize the best response. It did not work to generate meaningful strategic diversity. Uh, and yeah, Brandon can take it off from here. Yeah, so uh, just going into basically, you know, our naive approach to personal diversity. Um, we tried tragedy before, as Andre mentioned. Um, what's a naive approach to kind of how do we get diversity? And so uh, in this case, let's say we were given this repulsor agent A, and we want to train some agent B to uh, get lower term impaired with agent A. And so in this case, agent B is the adversary, uh, but then you want to get basically high self-play. So what you do is whenever you uh, play in self-play, um, you want to maximize your score, which is normal reinforcement learning. Um, so standard, this is great. And then on the flip side, when you uh, partner with agent A, though, uh, which is the agent you want to be diverse with, uh, you want to actually minimize the score. So you basically just invert all the rewards you get. Um, and then with some probably lambda, you partner with agent uh, A. And when it's some probably one minus lambda, you partner with agent B. Um, the super naive. This is uh, a very. This is a pretty simple version of what Lipo did, but also very similar to what they did. Um, and from here, uh, this is just one very naive way to approach diversity. Um, next slide, Andre. And then from here, what happens oh, is. I think. Hold on. I think it's a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hey. Um. Sorry. In the previous slide. Yeah. Um. So are these like both these agents getting trained together in such a way that when B and B play together, they get a high score, and when A and B play together, they get a bad score? Or are one of them like frozen or something? Yeah. A, or, a is oh. frozen, B 
be a strain. So the setup is you give me a give me some way of solving this game, uh, and I'm gonna give you a new way of solving this game that is different. Okay. So you already trained a policy for Hanabi, which is like policy A, which you also call the repulsor. And we're gonna train policy B, uh, which we call the adversary, to be different from the repulsor. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then so basically what happens when you do this self-pyrus response thing? Um what happens is basically, you know, um what agent B basically learns is it's trying to basically identify its partner. Um, when agent B thinks it's playing with agent B, you know, a normal self-play, it'll play normally. It's like, okay, awesome, I can maximize my score. Um, on the other hand, if it identifies it's playing with agent A, it'll actually intentionally lose the game. Intuitively, this does make sense because you're literally minimizing rewards at that point and, and by inverting rewards. So that means what's a good way to get higher rewards is to, you know, just intentionally lose the game. Um, empirically, I think uh, if we click on the slide, uh, yeah. So what happens is this is uh, basically a large matrix of uh, scores for a lot of different agents. Um, on each axis is just basically a different agent and a different seed. Um, the first four uh, columns, uh, first four rows and columns are basically just you know our baseline agents. These are normally trained agents that have been commonly used in Hanabi. Um, and then the other ones are all these self-play worst response agents and uh, three seeds each. If you see this bright yellow diagonal, we can see that basically we get, we can achieve very high you know self play scores. Like when play when play and self play, these agents are really really strong. But anything off diagonal, except for you know our baseline agents, you see that they get very very low scores. Um, so this means in the ad hoc team play setting, when you say you know take your self play worst response and partner with you know your pool, let's say rank bot, color bot, and clone bot, you actually do really really poorly in, in this ad hoc team play setting. Um, Fundamentally, what this means is, or and also this actually even holds in the case of just different seeds of the same algorithm. So if you try to try this, you know, self-play worst response algorithm on the same agent, but just a different seed, you actually can't even cooperate with, you know, the another variant of that on this uh, on just this on just a different seed. Um, and so basically, what happens is this is very indicative of saying of this uh, prior behavior that we noticed of saying, hey, when we you know we're playing with agent B, the agent will play normally. But if we play with anything else or we see anything else, we're just going to potentially lose the game. And this is just one very strong indicator of that. Uh, yeah, uh, Daphne, I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, quick question. So is this for two player teams or did you also try this with four, uh, three, four or five player teams? Yeah, in this case, we only did uh, focus on two player Hanabi just because of computational resources. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, Andre. Yeah, awesome. And then so, you know, how do we kind of fix this thing? One really naive way to do this is on your real trajectory, we can basically uh, basic, we can basically resample this partner at every time step. And so what does this kind of do? Um, well, I mean, this would prevent partner identifying, which is great. Because now you can't, you know, at every time step, you have no real idea of which partner you're playing with. Because instead of having entire trajectories where you're playing with, you know, either agent A or agent B, at every time step, you have to sample this thing. However, um, what does this lead to? This basically will lead to the case where we radically train our training distribution. Because fundamentally, that means the trajectories we see are just completely different. Our real trajectories are just completely different, and we have no real way of understanding this, and this becomes much, much harder. And so this also basically fundamentally would not work. And so what do we kind of do um, in this case? We, you know, we want to still enroll our policy as usual. Our real structure, you see the distribution we see, we still want to be that one, we want that, that to be completely normal. So that means that has to stay real. Um, and then, but what can we do then? Uh, what we can do is we can compute counterfactuals in, in the fictitious transition. Basically what this means is that in, it, we will still keep the real distribution, but in this fictitious transition and where we do all of our updates, we basically uh, can actually do the sampling uh, methodology, basically. And so this means also that we can only train our fictitious transitions, but that also, that's completely fine. I mean, well, there's methods for us that we can, there are methods that exist that we can just completely train the fictitious transitions. 
Um, and so how do we kind of do this now? Um, this does mean, obviously, uh, every tensor T, we have to basically do a statistical transition. So we need access to the simulator. And the method to we, in which we actually are able to bootstrap this office from is just called off-belief learning. Um, it's a paper from the Hanami group from uh, Meta AI um, uh, that was published in ICM 2021. And so overall, basically, this is our method adversity. Um, we keep the real we keep the real entire trajectory, but then every time step t, we take this fictitious transition, and we uh, sample basic. We do the sampling method, and then we only compute updates based on uh, where based on uh, these fictitious transitions. Um, this is a very high level overview of our method. Uh, we'll go into details uh, in update in the next couple of slides as well. Yeah. Um, so by the way, just. Okay, if questions are perfectly fine. Feel free to interrupt at any point. Uh, one thing to add here quickly is that because we have access to this resettable simulator, it means we can actually do the counterfactuals and not having them be completely wrong. Uh, we can actually hallucinate a state where we say, okay, what if we were actually playing with the uh, repulsor here and not with ourselves and think, would my action be misunderstood by the repulsor? if my, the repulsor would, would happen to be my partner? And if the answer is yes, then great. That is an action I want. I want an action that is both good if I'm playing with myself, but also that the repulsor would have been completely thrown off by it, right? Because that means I'm learning a different strategy. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, sorry, if you want to finish your thought, that's fine. That, that, that was it. I was about to go to the next slide, so this is perfect time. Cool. Um, I didn't understand like the third point that you can only train on fictitious transition. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't understand uh, what that. Means. I think it's going to become clear once I go over off belief learning. Uh, this is something we inherit from off belief learning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let me just go over that. And if you if it's still not clear afterwards, interrupt me again, and I'll be happy to dive deep. Is that good? Um. Sure. Yeah. Like my, the short version of that question is like, are we not training the B with the B? Uh, you are unrolling the, the policy B with policy B, yeah. but then at every time step, you think of a different scenario in which either you are paired up with A or paired up with B. Uh, so you can have like those two transitions, but you never train on the real data. And I'm going to show why this is important to prevent uh, arbitrary conventions. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks. So this was, thanks, Brandon, for the high level uh, of adversity. We're going to dive into OBL, and then we're going to come back to uh, adversity a second time, and hopefully everything will make sense. So on the left here, this is just uh, off-body learning recap. On the left here, we have vanilla key learning. You have your state, you observe some observation, you take an action, you move to the next state. Because we assume a turn-based game, it, we unroll for two steps, and then you compute your TD target, which is reward one plus reward two plus your value function. In this case, two learning, so max of bring values. So that's all very vanilla. OBL, you still have the same unrolling policy. So in black, nothing has changed. You still take actions in the trajectory just with your policy pi, or in this case, pi one. The one thing that changes is that every step, you're going to take your observation, you're going to pass it through a belief network. The belief network is simply a map from observations to states. What is my real state? What is the real state of the world given what I'm able to see? But in particular, it's pre trained. Uh, and I'm going to explain how after, but it's, it's pre-trained, it's fixed, it's given to me, and I'm going to resample a state from that belief. And I'm going to set now, in my fictitious world, uh, I'm going to set my state to what I resampled, and I'm going to apply my action there, unroll for two steps in that fictitious world, and this is what I'm computing my reward perspective. So one example you can think of is, think of a fire exercise. Someone tells you there's a fire exercise, and then you hear the alarm. In the real world, okay, you heard a fire alarm. It's right before lunchtime. What is the optimal be behavior? Well, in the real world, you know there's no fire. So what you should ideally do is go pick up your lunch, try to find your friends, bring out your laptop, and then go out once you've done all of, the, all of those things. 
However, there is a fictitious world where that fire alarm actually corresponds to a real fire. And there, what you want is to get out of the building as fast and as safely as possible. And if you have firemen overseeing the, your evacuation plan and kind of like rating you on it, the rating is gonna be assigned to you. So like the reward is gonna be assigned to you based on how efficient was your evacuation in a world where you all hallucinate that there is an actual fire, right? And so this is what uh, off-belief learning is doing. It's taking some action, but then only receiving rewards based on this fictitious, hallucinated world. Uh, and in particular, what OBL does is that this belief network is trained on a fully random policy. What this means is that any form of, info of correlation between past actions and the real state of the world is going to be washed away uh, by this resampling unless it carries verifiable information. So uh, another example is if I want to communicate to you that I have a phone in my hand, I, we could try to learn our kind of like signals that if I, if I wave my hand, that means I have, uh, sorry, I have a, a phone in my pocket. Uh, and like, this means I have a phone and like, this means I don't. But there's like a million different signals. All of those, if you assume I'm a completely crazy and random individual, neither, none of those signals would carry any meaning. But if and if I'm completely crazy, this is the assumption you have about me, and I actually bring out my phone and show it to you, then you know that I have a phone. Even if that action was taken randomly, there is, it's verifiable information. And this is what off-belief learning is doing. It's only allowing policies to learn to convey information in a verifiable, grounded way. Is that somewhat clear? Uh, I'll take the lack of questions for a yes. Um, yes. I forgot to raise my hand. Um, no, a good explanation. I was just wondering because there are so many variants uh, of like of belief type learning methods, like uh, Lola or proximal methods. Like, it's, how do you do? So, of belief learning is not related to Lola. Lola is about understanding the learning of another learning agent in your environment. Oh, okay. Um, but how do you deal with, for example? What, what happened what, what do you do if they if an agent somehow learns like an arbitrary correlation or a correlation that is not relevant well know, here's the beautiful yeah. thing with the setup you cannot because you always resample the observation uh, so you resample the state based on your belief and your belief is trained on a fully random policy so like max entropy or epsilon zero uh it will it breaks off these correlations where if in the past i took action i because i observed some some aspect of the state uh for instance if in hanabi if i have cards and someone told me the card is red and uh they told me that because they always hint red and a card is playable well what obiel is going to say is they can resample all of the possible values of this card as long as it's red so if I play it, maybe it's not playable in this other fictitious world. So it's going to prevent the correlation that red is playable unless it carries fully, uh, like full information. For instance, if I knew the rank in advance. Okay. Right. Thanks. So this is why we use off-belief learning. This is why we only train on fictitious transitions is to prevent this kind of self-reinforcing correlation, right? Uh, because if not, if there's a high correlation between some action I take randomly and some feature of the state that you don't observe, if I do that often enough and you respond to it accordingly, we're gonna reinforce this, right? So then we can present uh, adversity in full or greater detail. On the left, it's again of belief learning. There's not the notation is a bit different. Uh, there's the VDEF, but apart from that, it's the same actual diagram. We use tau instead of state, uh, and we use pi l and pi l minus one instead of pi one and pi two. The reason for it being that you can actually iterate the VL. So you start to run a policy, you train pi one, then you use pi one, you 
learn the belief network and you iterate. So you learn pi two on top of pi one and you build a hierarchy like that. Um, so here on the left, again, just the OBL, trans uh, the OBL transition. On the right, we have the adversarial transition that is unique to adversity. And here, mu is our repulsor. It's probably gonna make it easier if I do this. Uh, so on the left is how I train my behave my uh, new ad adversary, the policy B, to be good in self play using awful deep learning. And then on the right is how I train it to be bad with the repulsor. So at time step T, it with probability one as lambda, I just do vanilla OBL. And probability lambda, I'm instead gonna sample uh, a state from a belief where I assume I've been playing with the adversary up to this time step. So I'm, now I'm hallucinating this world where my partner is actually the adversary. And I want my action, uh, I mean, I come action now, the adversary is playing the next time step. And I want to be in a situation afterwards where we got negative rewards. And uh, that is how I optimize for playing poorly with the adversary, right? But then once all of this is done, when all, like, all of the transition is blue is done, I then come back to my regular real world in black where nothing happened and no intervention from the uh, repulsor from the green agent actually had any impact on the world, right? So it's kind of a complete sandbox where I can compute all the counterfactuals I want, like playing with the, uh, with the repulsor, maybe losing the game, and then it's fine, I can come back. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, um, a couple of questions here. Um, first one is this state, the tau, mm -hmm. that's the state of the whole system, right? Yes. Like for both yeah. of them. Okay. Um, second question was, uh, so we're updating the policy of B using this counterfactual? Yeah, this in, in both of those diagrams, the only thing yeah. which means B. A was given to me, it's yeah. a fixed policy. Uh, it's one way of playing the game and I'm trying to find another. So what's the difference between this counterfactual and like, let's just say actually executing it in the oh. actual environment or something? Uh, the difference is, so what we're trying to avoid is by having the the adversary actually take a step in the real environment and then terminating the game or affecting the training distribution. This is the problem that Brandon was talking about. Where, you know, imagine I actively try to have a, a strategy that the repulsor will not understand. Well, if, I, if I'm successful, I'm gonna take an action that the repulsor won't understand. The repulsor as a result makes a mistake we lose the game, bam, my trajectory is over. If I'm good enough at that, I'm never even gonna see the end game. I'm never even gonna learn to be good uh, because it completely messes the training distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do all of those counterfactuals of like, oh, how can I learn to take actions that the repulsor won't be able to understand and that will be incompatible with the repulsor without actually having to uh have it intervene in our games and without having to ident without learning to identify the repulsor like lipo does okay and uh just a follow-up question to like the value updating part yes the, so in the right hand uh diagram when mm -hmm. i update the the value function of the b the one yes. in the middle yeah this one yeah so does it affect the behavior with the other B, like in the real environment? So the way we actually do this uh, is that despite the fact that we use PPO, we actually have a batch. Uh, so we just store those transitions uh, in a batch and we only train after the fact. So it's not like constantly a bit. Rather, we probably have more details on that on the implementation side if you, mm -hmm. if I go deeply to that. Cool, thanks. So this is another view, it's just our entire algorithm. Uh, I'm probably gonna skip over. And then we have the actual update with the VDIF. What this is encoding for, in short, is simply uh, 
the value function in this world where with some probability at every future time step, the adversary comes in and like hot swaps with my partner and I try to be bad with it for like a few time steps and then goes out, right? So we encode for all of this constant uh, changing in partners and this is what we use to update our policy in the TV update. All right. So if the algorithm is clear, I'm going to leave it for, to Brandon. Oh, oh yes. Yep. Go ahead, Eugene. Hey, um, so just, just if we go back to that prior slide, like we wind up here kind of uh, taking some convex combination of these two things. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think I fully understand how this affects the like the resultant behavior. Like, does the agent like just average between the probability that it's playing with a uh, adversary? And does that type of behavior make sense to kind of just average between the two possible worlds that you're in? Um, yeah, Sorry, I, I know the question's vague. Uh, so. Answer number one is uh, it makes sense because it works empirically. Answer number two, which is because that person is probably not very satisfying, is that we are assuming that we kind of never know who we are playing, but that we have this like probability of playing one or the other. Um, and so if you go back to like one of the early diagrams where we have this hot swapping, like at, at every time step, maybe I'm playing with my, my myself, maybe I'm playing with the repulsor. And then I have to be to account for both. Where if I'm playing with myself, I have high, I want high reward. If I'm playing with the repulse, I want low reward. Uh, essentially, what this does is it's gonna it's gonna bias the policy towards actions that are at the same time good in the sense that this in self play uh, you're gonna get high return, but also bad if you happen to be paired up with the repulse. Uh, and you can never condition on who you're playing. So you try to find the space of strategies that are both like work well in the game, but the repulsor won't be able to get and respond to. And then that, that's a very the, interesting answer. Sorry, but continue. I didn't realize you were. Yeah. Well, and then maybe like the third aspect, which is not in the paper, is that we believe there's scenarios in which you can break this um, that don't necessarily arise in Hanabi, but that might have to do with like delayed rewards because then you have to like reason about which policy may most likely to be playing at like t plus two kind of thing. Um, so there's probably work to be done into actually like diving deeply into this objective and see what are the, its theoretical properties are with like the reward and so on. But we know it works in Hanabi and this is, at least for us, kind of a big feat because we've tried to do that for two years to get strategy diversity in Hanabi. And this is the first. And we, I'm gonna show you some results. Like we get strategies in Hanabi that achieve over 24 score that nobody has seen before. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I, I buy all those answers. And I'll be interested to talk about the third one if we have some time at the end. Because... Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Pranay, how do you think? Um, so mine's gonna be really quick. Uh, I'll try not to ask any follow-ups. Um, the lambda parameter is i'm assuming that that's held constant throughout the training because it doesn't have any time step was there any attempts to vary that in any way so good question or over like a uh, GAE kind of formulation so good question the i mentioned briefly that obl trains a hierarchy of policies because we inherit from obl we also have to do that uh, we're actually given some repulsor we're going to train like policy one and then like iterate on policy two, keeping the repulsor fixed, right? So we actually decrease lambda over hierarchies, but we don't decrease within the episode. Uh, but there's probably room for improvement there because we did something that we had like a linear schedule or something like that. Uh, and it's over four hierarchies. I'm sure it, I should do like smart things if you do that. So, Brandon? Yeah, um, just uh, yeah, just to go over basically Hanabi, because it's uh, the benchmark that I focus on in this paper. Um, 
basically the goal of Hanabi is to build these fireworks. Uh, in the two-player version or in the, any end-player version, you see all of your partner's cards, but you don't see your cards. Um, you have these things called hint tokens. Um, and then uh, basically these hint tokens, uh, you burn one to provide hints to your partners about the cards. Um, and fundamentally, you can do three actions. You can either hint, uh, you can play, or you can discard cards. Um, so in this case, uh, what do we do first? Um, next slide. Yes, perfect. OK, so in this case, basically, my partner is my partner's turn. Um, and he hints these two cards are ones. Uh, hint basically will apply to all cards uh, that have that uh, in your hand that have that uh, property. So in this case, only uh, these two cards are ones, basically. And from here, you remove a hint token. Um, so what do you do next? So now it's my turn. What do I do? Um, think about this. And then basically, I say, OK, I want to play this one. So we have to play all the cards in rank order. Um, and then also, basically, that means if there's a red two in my hand, I can play that next. Um, that's your partner's turn again. So what do I do? Or what do they do? Um, or yeah, okay. So perfect. Sorry, transitions are great. Um, my partner then hinted this card is now red. So this means a few things. First of all, this means that the other one in my hand isn't red. So um, in coordination, this can mean a few different interesting things. Or I can do a few things. One, typically, this means that this first card could be a red too. Um, that's one common way to play Hanabi. The other thing I could do is also play, you know, this other one in my hand. I could also try to signal to my partner that their green one is also playable. Um, there's a myriad of options. Um, how can I signal to my partner? One is just directly hinting it's a green card. Another way is it, it's a, another way is to directly say, hey, there's a one in your hand. That should also mean it's playable. Um, some other conventions that we actually discovered in our adversity is, for example, uh, we can actually discard like our second card, or and that can also mean hey, this one is play your first card is playable. Um, there's a variety of different things that can be discovered. And un and figuring out basically how our partners are playing is really important to coordination and not basically. And then, yeah, in this case, I thought to myself, you know, thought really hard after this very long talk and said, OK, I think this card is red and it's playable, so I'm going to play the red too now. And so now we have a game score of two. And basically, we keep iterating in this turn-based game um, between hint, discard, and play um, until we run out of uh, cards in the deck. Cool. So in terms of results, on the left, we have the same matrix as we had before. Uh, on the right, we have the equivalent for our adversity instead of self favors response. So in short, what we want to see here is, uh, as Brown was saying earlier, on the left, we see that the agents have this like friend or foe mechanic where they treat everything else except for themselves as foes. And on the right, uh, we have a different kind of like mosaic of colors. And what we want, we don't necessarily want this to be all as good as possible because if it was all like high 24 scores, what it would mean is that the policies would essentially be equivalent. We would achieve high, uh, like highly skilled policies, but we have. 12 times the same policy. We wouldn't have diversity. Instead, what we want is what we get, which is this range of different scores, right? Like some policies happen to be similar, happen to like work quite well together, and therefore get scores like 16 or like 20. Uh, some other policies are actually not that compatible, and they get like 0, 1, or like 7. And that's good. This is what we want, because we don't expect all policies to be intercompatible, uh, but we also don't expect them to literally throw the game if this kind of like handshake at the beginning isn't met. So we don't want to do sabotage. Uh, so this is good. And another way uh, we can look at uh, if we achieve diversity is to actually try to visualize the behavior of the policies. This is uh, an action matrix. It's basically saying, given that some action was played at time step t on the column, what is the action that was played at time step t plus one on uh, sorry, uh, times that on the row, and then times that t plus one on the columns. So for instance, if we take the upper left policy, which is one of the policies that was like training uh, other play, which is a paper from 2020, this policy is gonna hint rank a lot. So the like bottom section, and in response to a rank hint, it's gonna play its most recent card. We call this, this uh, policy rank bot because it uses rank to indicate playable cards. The second one right below it, is the opposite. It's actually using color to indicate label cards. 
and then we have a human clone policy, and we have off the return. What happens if we apply adversity to this? Well, we get this kind of like range of different behaviors. Uh, and, but in particular, say if you have like a repulsor to a policy that uses rank, we're going to actually discover a policy that uses color to make it black. Vice versa, uh, the adversity to a policy that uses color is going to learn to use rank. And then there's other variants. The bottom one uh, is interesting, actually, like the top one as well, uh, because it learns this behavior that following a discard, it's going to play a card automatically. And this is unexpected because it's not the way humans play, but it also doesn't necessarily make sense because if you are conservative with your hands, that in the way that you always have hands available, it makes sense to say, I'm going to play a card by default unless you tell me in advance that I shouldn't play. It. And this is the kind of behavior we haven't seen anywhere else with any of the Hanabi policies we've chained over like the course of five or six papers. Uh, so this is brand new behavior to the six item. Um, and then we can also look at how well do our policies do on average. So this is like compressing the matrices that we saw on the top, top table. So for each of the four uh, repulsors that we have that are like fixed policies, if we train a software was response, what kind of scores do we get in self play? And this is high for both. This is just an indicator of skill. Does it know how to play the game well? But then how well does it play with the uh, repulsor, the policy trait to be different from? We can see self was response is much more aggressive. It actually gets zero with all the uh, repulsors because it's learning to sabotage. Ours is a bit more mellow, so not quite as incompatible, but still kind of low. And then how well does it perform with other seeds? And then we can see that ours is generally more uh, intercompatible with some other seeds. And indeed, if we look at the behaviors that we see, they tend to be uh, across different seeds, we tend to see the same behavior emerge repeatedly. Uh, Brandon also mentioned the issue of sabotages, and we can count this in Hanabi very explicitly. Uh, here, what we count is in Hanabi, if you play a card that isn't playable, you lose a life. If you lose three lives, the game ends or score is zero. Uh, and we can count the number of times the policy will play a card where it knows both the rank and the color, and it knows it's not playable. So for instance, if there's like a red one on the table, and now I know I have a green five, and I'm gonna, oh, sorry, it says there's a red one, and I have like a, a red five, and I'm just playing it on top, because we know five doesn't go on top of one, we need a two first, and then three and four. And self was response, or LiPo, um, gets on average two sabotages per game, out of a maximum of three, possibly. Uh, adversity, meanwhile, gets uh, something much lower, so much lower, so under 0 0.1. And this is an indicator that we actually managed to solve the sabotage issue that was making the self service response policies extremely unreasonable. Um, that's about it. So, in short, adversity trains strong and diverse policies and also reasonable ones. Uh, it avoids the problem of sabotages, which plagued the concurrent work. Uh, we use off-belief learning to prevent arbitrary conventions because past works have shown that self-play will lead to arbitrary conventions and will be open sourced as soon as uh, legal gets back to me and gives me the thumbs up. Um, that is all. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to use my powers to ask a question first. Thank you for the great sure. talk. And then uh, Daphne, I think, has a question. Um, is there, to me, I, I don't see anything that makes this restricted to cooperative games. Um, is this generally applicable or am I missing something? That's a good question. Uh, so, We rely on the idea of incompatibility. If you were to do this for competitive games, say like two players or some, it's unclear how you would translate that. Incompatibility. Would it be like the opposite where you try to take actions that are good for your opponent 
I don't think that would work because in a two players or some game, if you take an action that is in that is like bad for so that is like good for your opponent, it automatically means it's bad for you. Whereas in, in this scenario, we can take an action that is misunderstood by my opponent, but that still is good. Um, yeah, I was thinking of mixed games rather than zero sum games. Um, yeah, I don't know. But if you have ideas, I think it'd be really cool. Cool. Yeah, Bye. I'll think on it and get back to you. Um, I think Daphne was up next. Thank you again for the great talk. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks as well for the great talk. I really enjoyed it and lots of nice visuals there. <laughs> um, uh, I was just wondering, um, so I'm not, I don't know a lot about Anabi, but do players also have specific properties? Because I can imagine in other cooperative games or games where uh, agents can form teams, that two agents or three agents may be incompatible in the sense that they're very different, but maybe they make like amazing teams. So I was yes. just wondering how that's, yeah, how, so that's how a, that works. That's a good question. Um, if you go back all the way, it's Life actually had a better diagram for this than we do here. So this is again the, the principle that we apply. So there, yes, uh, this is the, the principle that, that we apply. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, it doesn't matter if you have different roles. So you can think of like in Hanabi, this is not a case where like both roles are symmetric, uh, except for the fact that you have an agent that starts first, uh, but you can use the same exact same network size and policy. But you could imagine a world where you have like very different roles with different action sets, different state, different observation spaces and so on. So imagine you have like pi A1 and pi A2. All you're saying is, well, I want, if I swap, say pi A2 with pi B2, or if I swap pi A1 with pi B1, I want those mixed teams to still work well. Uh, or if you're doing adversity, you would say, I want those to not work well, right? And everything else still applies. So you would have to like have maybe two different networks depending on like each of the roles. Like, are you a pi one role or a pi two role? But apart from that, you can still do everything. Um, so this this is not at all a problem for this method. But that's a good question. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Yes, Vipali? Vipali? Yeah, um, so I've got two questions, if that's okay. <laughs> so first question is uh, kind of like an implementation question. So how are the, like, where do I get the B agent from? Like in Hanabi, I can't exactly train one guy on its own. Right, so are they trained with like previous agents and then you just extrapolate one out of them or something? Um, so yeah, that's the first question. The second question is, I didn't quite understand the motivation of why we want diversity um, in Hanabi. Like, I don't know the game much. So maybe if you could help me with that intuition. Brian, I want to take the first one? Yeah, I can take the first one. Um, so typically uh, in Hanabi, you whenever you do self-play or even off-belief learning, um, you do it in this method where like, you're taking pi A and training with pi A. Um, so you are, you form, or you can form teams however you want. Um, you can make these different distributions. You could train like pi A with a fixed pi B, sort of making new directories, but then only train on the rewards generated by pi A. Um, so fundamentally, like you can kind of form these arbitrary teams. Um, in this case, for adversity, what you do is you would pre-train this pi A. Um, so in this case, uh, lots of play by rank or by color or whatever methodology it is. Um, this uh, adversity doesn't is very agnostic to whatever you know uh, repulsor agent we have, um, and so that's totally fine. Um, the second question: What could you run the second question again? Um, it it was about diversity. Like, why is diversity even helpful here? Yeah, so I mean, fundamentally, um, I think if Andre could go forward to Hanabi slides, uh, or I, I think when I talk about Hanabi, basically, um, there is this point where basically my partner gave me a hint of a red card. Um, they said, I already played the one, they gave me a hint of red. And from here, it's like, okay, there's you know a lot of different things I could do, um, or this red could hit me. Um, there are 
players that could basically say, hey, this red this red could mean this is a red five for some reason. I don't know why they hit it this way, but it could mean that. Um, and if that does happen, then it's basically understanding um, understanding like what they're meaning basically. Uh, and so, because when basically in the real world, if you were to you know encounter a human, let's say in self driving, or in this case in Hanabi, um, you encounter whatever team, whatever team and convention they have, um, your goal is to be as good with them as possible. So you need to be able to see as many different countries as possible. Um, this is one way to kind of do that is basically saying, hey, we want to see as many different teams. Such that if we encounter this in the wild, we won't like absolutely blow up basically. Does that gotcha. kind of make sense? Yeah, 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 totally. So we want to be more like generalizable yep. to like different teammates. Yeah, yeah. got that. Uh, another, so this is for train time, but another simple thing just for test time. Suppose I come to you and I say, I have the bo the best and most general uh, uh, policy for this cooperative game. Maybe Hanabi, maybe a different game, but I have the best one. How do you evaluate it? Right? How do you know it generalizes well to other yeah. partners that have different strategy? But mm -hmm. if you're not if you're not able to produce somehow a pool of diverse test agents, how are we going to test it? Gotcha. This is why we need diversity. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, we've hit the the limit of the presentation. Um, thanks again for coming, giving this presentation. Um, and for having you know, us. Folks have have questions um i guess they can send them to you uh, afterwards yeah i'm also okay. so i'm not in a rush if there's like still questions i can still okay yeah around. uh we don't have to end this early um i have to head out but uh That's i'll fine. leave the meeting I'm remote still with some questions if you if you want to stay um yeah, yeah, I